This is Mongolia Mindset, and today we're going to be responding to Connor uh, Tennis. Can you type Megan Kelly? Okay. Um, let's see what the monkeys over at Personality Database got her as. Um, they got Megan Kelly as an ESTJ. Um, we will use Linda Barron's uh, temperament and interaction styles combined with cognitive functions to figure out her actual personality type. <clears throat> and. We are uh, still doing the free typing sessions. Um, I think when we get to 50 in the catalog, we'll stop. So you might want to hurry up and get that while you can. Um, we had a pretty, we had a good amount of them last week. Um, we are posting the interview with Dario uh, Nardi uh, later this week, just polishing up on a couple things. Um, but it was an epic interview. Dario dropped great insights like he always does. Um, if you are just getting into typology or you want to take your knowledge to the next level, highly recommend you pick up his Udemy courses. Um, they're on sale um, pretty cheap right now. So uh, I think it's like maybe 15 bucks or something. Uh, I think after the sale, it goes up to 350 bucks. So get that while you can, man. I promise you it's worth the value, especially if you want the real information and not the fake. Um, yeah. But let's get into this. Oh, wait. We got to go over the things. So these are the metrics you have uh, initiating versus responding. That's basically um, extroverted versus uh, introvert. So uh, introverts are gonna initiate more. Um, they're gonna interrupt people. They're gonna change subject. Uh, they're okay with taking a lead. Um, so what, what is shown in the extroverts uh, brain wiring is they have a quicker uh, network to get information out. So it's more of the front centers of the brain. And then the introverts, the information has to travel to the back of the brain. Um, so that's the reason why they're more responding. They reflect. Um, they don't stay on topic. Um, that, that's what the introverts are going to do. <clears throat> and then you got abstract versus concrete. Um, abstract is all about the what ifs, um, what's possible, um, things outside of the five senses. Um, and then concrete is basically what is, what's the experience is basically staying dry, not going anything outside of the five senses. Um, then you got systematic versus interest. Uh, systematic is do they apply uh, the best way to doing things? Um, are they applying structures or routines to get control over their life? That's more of a systematic approach. And then there's interest versus motive. Uh, interest people tend to just go with the flow. Uh, they're going to use interest. Like, is it is it in their interest to, to do something? Um, what are other people doing? Um, like my ESFP cousin, whenever we go out, he's literally always talking about what other people are doing. And I'm just like, bro, what are you talking about? Oh, you didn't see that, man? Like, this person looking at us this way and that? Or, like, man, that girl looking over here? Like, he's always looking at people's motives. Or, man, they, they didn't give us this because of that. You know, it's like, he's always checking out people's motives. Um, so then you have direct versus informative. Um, are they specific, concise, and to the point? Uh, are they directing the flow? Are they choosing that role in the conversation? Um, that Do they generally like to tell people what to do? That's going to be uh, more direct. Are they forceful when they talk? That's direct, okay? And then you have the informative, which is vague, wordy, beating around the bush, uh, passive, uh, taking a one-down road, doesn't really like to tell people what to do, likes to give people information and then allow them to make the choice. Um, that's going to be more of the informative language. Um, then you have the pragmatic versus affiliative. Pragmatic is all about being uh, individual mindset, uh, utilitarian mindset. Um, it's going to be more rebellious, contrarian, um, like freedom. They're going to be, they're, they're going to like their freedom. Um, and while the affiliative is all about doing what's right, um, it's all about cooperation, it's about uh, interdependence, um, it's about the collective, uh, that's more of the affiliative mindset. Um, then you got outcome versus progression, it's like where the focus line, are they looking at the end product, is everything to get to the end product, or are they about the journey? Um, the outcome, uh, people are, if, if they don't get the outcome, then the journey doesn't mean anything. For the journey to have significance, uh, they had to, to reach the outcome. But progression people, they're, they're okay with not getting the outcome. Um, the journey is what they're after, okay? Um, and like I said, uh, with outcome, it's kind of like screeching stops when they talk. It's like end product, end product, end product. By progression, things like flow so much better, just flow so much better. Um, then you got SE and NI. Um, SE is all about uh, manipulating the environment. So SE people are gonna talk about what other people um, are doing. They're gonna use other things for memory totems. Um, the memory is not going to be as great or as detailed 
as an SI user. Um, then you have NI, which is the best path forward. What's the future looking like? What was most likely to occur? Um, these people can generally uh, transform their lives um, just with, you know, what they what they think, you know, what they believe. Um, they'll set out on it and, and they'll accomplish it. That's more of an NI approach. Um, then you got the SI. SI is all about the past. Uh, it's going to reference the past and to notice differences um, in the current. Uh, they care about being comfortable, uh, being stable, security, um, that type of thing. And then NE is all about the collective, like what, what if, um, all the possibilities there, uh, brainstorming, that type of thing. And then you got TE and FI. Uh, TE is all about like outside sources. It's all about um, uh, methodologies, um, things like that and then FI is all about what that person finds important for themselves what's their values um, that's more of FI and you got TI FE which is basically the understanding package um, TI is going to understand logical frameworks FE is going to want to understand other people's values um, and morals and you know, how they feel and things like that but um, they have her as a ESTJ here and ESTJs are direct uh, the outcome, the initiating, um, their affiliative, their concrete, their T E F I, uh, and their S I N E. Um, so let's get into it. Let's see if she is one. And guys, if you guys could please subscribe, that helps us grow the channel. That make helps us grow the group. And you know, we're all about growing Mongolian mindset uh, to help everybody grow. You know, we do our monthly calls. Monthly calls are very powerful. Uh, make sure all of us stay focused on our goals and. Um, have a better tomorrow and a better future um, so we do that once a month I think that one's gonna be that Friday June 2nd right before my birthday which is June 3rd so uh, I'll probably be out of town i um, doing that call but looking forward to seeing you guys we need to beat our numbers from last time we had 14 people on last time I want to shatter that maybe get 18 let's go for it but Megan the news Kelly. if you follow the news you know Megan Kelly but how much do you know about her she started as a legal reporter, then became a star anchor at Fox News. Welcome to the Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. Then she moved to NBC. Welcome, I am Megan Kelly. Where she was basically told, shut up. Although I didn't know until our interview that she was told to shut up at Fox, too. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show. Only now that she has her own independent show can she say whatever she wants. The new reporting about the border Ah, oh, this story. More about that in a moment. I got to know Kelly when we worked together at Fox. John Stossel is the anchor of Stossel on the Fox Business Network and my guest now. We and our families became friends. And then I watched, sometimes in shock, as strange and sometimes nasty things happened to her. A few weeks ago, we finally sat down to talk about that. It's easier to speak freely now, now that we're both our own bosses. Here's our full interview. We worked together. We had to answer to bosses. We're both free. Yeah. Talk about that. It's awesome. It's completely liberating. You know, that was my only mission in coming back into our business. My only mission in coming back, that's an outcome. It's an outcome in mind. Business. I didn't want a corporate overlord. OK, that's pragmatic. Didn't want a cor corporate overlord. Um, I can say that's TEFI as well. I didn't want it to be implicit, what I was supposed to say. Like, I felt it was at Fox, though they're not, not nearly as bad as some of the others, nor explicit as I felt it was at NBC. I just wanted to do the news in the way I thought was appropriate. And now, I, it's just, it's great. I wanted my freedom pragmatic the way I wanted to. That's S E N N I. Nobody bothers me, and I'm totally uncancelable. Uncancelable, right? And I felt pretty free at Fox. They let me do what I wanted to pretty much. I found Fox just as respectable as ABC. They were both biased, and Fox was more open about it. They never told me don't do stories on legalizing drugs or open more open immigration. But there were always a couple people who would flip out at something stupid and it was threatening yeah 
Well, my experience at Fox was, well, first of all, yes, if you crossed paths with the media relations department, you know, they would cut you. So you had to be afraid you of that. cross paths with media, what's called, they would cut you. That's the outcome again. But And explain, how would they cut you? You'd get it. I mean, you, you'd get a phone call and you'd get threatened, you'd get yelled at, you'd get told you're a bad... You get this, you get this, you get that, you get that, and they're hitting her F.I. inferior already. That's S-E-N-I. This woman's looking like an E-N-T-J. Person, you'd get... And you'd get bad publicity. They'd yeah, the next... Stuff. Exactly. The next thing you knew, there'd be a negative article on you. I experienced this mostly uh -oh. when I didn't support Roger during the whole Me Too crisis. And because, I mean, that was the irony of my relationship with him. He mostly protected me. And, this and is Roger Ailes. Roger Ailes would protect me. And so most of the people there did not mess with me. And he and I had a great relationship, which is one of the reasons why it was so complicated for me when I was forced to decide whether I was going to come forward with this story about what had happened between us um, or not. Got a whole movie made about you based on that. It's like we're telling women, go on, speak up for yourself, just know the entire network is with Roger. No one will believe you. It was largely accurate because it was based in large part on my book and the stories of the other women, you know, who went through it. Um, though I had nothing to do with it. In any event, at that point, I wasn't being Okay, this woman's direct. Okay, she's direct. Let's go ahead and hit her for direct. She's direct. She is direct. So with that being said, direct types here. Um, the direct types are INFJ, ENFJ, INTJ, ENTJ, ISTJ, ESTJ, ISTP, and ESTP. All the informal types are eliminated. Uh, this one is direct. You can kind of feel the force from her talking. That's one of the things of being um, direct. She's very forceful. Protected by him, and sure enough, you can see the hit pieces drop, and that was, of course, the media relations department trying to gin up support for him. So it's a sophisticated operation. That gets reporters to write nasty stories about their own employees. It's not just Fox. <laughs> I'd love to tell you, oh, it's just the mean people over at Fox News. Not even close. Um, they look like absolute teddy bears compared to... T names, teddy bears. Where else I've been. I'll put it that way. Wow. Well, now you're free. We're both free. Let's back up and talk about your career from your book. We didn't have money or connections. If I was going to have any success, it was going to be the result of working hard. And you really did. And you became a lawyer and then decided law sucked and just broke into TV. Yeah, well, I like that because if you believe you can do it with hard work, and then you align yourself with something that makes sense. You know, I, I wouldn't have believed that had I wanted to be a prima ballerina, that could have happened at 30. I wouldn't have believed TFI. Two, when I switched from law to TV. But I knew the skill set I had developed was going to translate. I used my head and I made a sound judgment about how to use my skills and where I might meaningfully apply them. And so I knew it could do the TV job. In Woodbridge, Megan Kendall. This woman's all come. It was one of the things that attracted me to it. You know, I, I knew in my bones I could do it. So, That's yeah, I, 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 I knew in my bones I could do it. That's it, I absolutely loved both professions. The TV thing kind of ran out of steam, or the, the, the law thing ran out of steam when I realized how boring it was. And the TV thing never ran out of steam. I still love doing media and I being still a reporter. Love TFI and being a More commentator FI. on the news. The news to me is exciting. And it's a privilege to be able to deliver it to people and talk about it every day. Do you tell your kids you gotta work really hard? Yes, I mean, not like that, but I do. Not like you do. Well, I don't, I don't really praise them all the time for how smart they are, because I just don't think that gets you anywhere. I'll I come. praise them if I... So I'm a dog, huh? So let's do that. She's outcome. With that being said, that makes it down to three types. That's going to be the ESTJ, ESTP, uh, ENTJ, and ENFJ. This is pretty horrible, guys. I'm sorry. 
but she's one of them because she's too wrecked and she's out of gun. I see them struggling and they stick stick with it. You know, like stick with it is what I want to praise. My mother told me you better work hard or you'll freeze in the dark. Oh. Or sometimes she would say you'll starve in the cold. <laughs> and I took that to heart and always worked hard because I was scared of failure. Were you scared of failure? Uh, Are you scared of failure? Not really. No, you're much more relaxed now. Yeah, I'm not identifying with that. Not, that's not resonating with me. No, that's My, not that's, that's uh, not resonating with me. That's T E F I, and that's some F I. That's some F I, and she's a T E F I user. So, with that being said, we are eliminating E S T P. Goodbye, sir. And E N F J. Goodbye. They're T I users. So we're down to E S T J and E N T J. Personal database. You're still in the hunt. Upbringing was very relaxed. I did not have a parent who was in any way a tiger parent. My parents were like... Tiger parent, that's a name. We should take typing twice, because we don't sense great things coming down the pike for you. <laughs> Which I did, by the way. I'm really good at typing. Um, it was more something I put on myself. You know, I, I was... Were they surprised when great things came down the pike? Very, yes, very. I, I always joke that you need to do just the right amount of damage to your child if you want him or her to be really successful. You need to do... Oh, my God. That's outcome, and that's a little pragmatic there. I mean, Jesus. Um, enough that they have a chip on their shoulder. And SE. But not so much that they can't recover from the chip. And I think the reason I did well and wanted to work so hard is I, I just had something to prove. I had something to prove to myself. I didn't want people to diminish me or think I couldn't or think I was just my people what people think that's TFI some more to, you know bubble-headed bleach blonde that's some more TFI girl you starting to get like Donald Trump um and it was fun to be underestimated I thought you were a bubblehead blonde I know I apologize to you and the Bill O'Reilly O'Reilly green room I remember that it was classic Stossel you came over into this big confession of something that made you look very bad that I otherwise would have had no idea about. <laughs> so you. I think I said, I, I, you're really smart and quick, and I thought you were another one of the Fox Blondes who are pretty smart and quick. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't know what my point was, but... I took it in the spirit in which it was offered. But no, it's fun to be underestimated. I love that T-shirt. Underestimate me. See how that goes. You I love that T-shirt. Yeah, uh, on the me. Right, that, that as a child you were bullied. Yeah. And people flicked fingers at you, and why? Well, I thought about that. I was not an attractive child, the record should reflect. I had a big space between my two front teeth. I just I had acne. I was a little chunky. I had a terrible haircut. It just, it wasn't going well for me until about like high school when I discovered hair dye um, and got my teeth fixed. You're so, not a natural blonde? Uh, dark blonde, but the lighter blonde is a little prettier. Anyway, so it wasn't, oh, she's attractive and we want to get her. That can happen to young girls. It wasn't my situation. I think they came for me because I had a big personality. And um, that can be threatening, too. You know, I, I had a bigger personality then than I do now, socially. Oh, you were extroverted, obviously. We know you're extroverted. Wait. I, I would say I channeled my big personality professionally now, but in my personal life, I'm much more likely to be quiet at the dinner table, you know, than, than I would have been back then. And little Wait, girls- as a kid, you were a loud mouth? Yeah, I was a loud mouth. And not everybody likes that. Pragmatic. As it turns out. And what would they do? This, so when I was in fourth grade, you. I went to a birthday party and I, they came over and started flicking me like this, all of them. And I was crying, and they wouldn't stop flicking me. And it being the 70s, there was no grown-up in sight. And so I just made my way. I ran inside and called my house and asked my parents to come get me. These were all girls? All girls. My dad got me. I cried the whole way home. And I'll never forget, we walked in the house. And my mom looked over, and my dad went. But the worst, the worst was my seventh grade year. 
That was a full year of bullying. It was a full year of torture. And uh, it culminated, nobody would talk to me. I was the scourge of my class. Mm. Mostly it was driven by a group of about 15 girls, but the rest just went along. And the ringleader was scary. You know, if she turned on you, you could be next if you joined with me versus her. I, I had nobody on my side. And it culminated in this terrible incident where she had this big party and I knew they were having a party and I wasn't invited. It was a cold, snowy, Albany night. And the phone rang, or house phone. My parents were sitting over there. What are you talking about? And she name? said, it's me. She said, do you know where all the people who are coming to my party are? All the guests at my party? And I said, no. And they all screamed in the phone, we're here. And you're not. Yeah. And I went out the backyard and just skated around the frozen over snow, hoping my parents had not picked up what had just happened. And you wrote, to this day, one thing I cannot tolerate is a bully, which brings me to Donald Trump, because <laughs> he's a bully. Definitely. And I look back at what you said to him that caused such a fuss. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. Your Twitter account Only is Rosie several... O'Donnell. <laughs> For the record, it was well beyond Rosie O'Donnell. Yes, I'm sure it was. You're... You could have said more about his sexism. What did he expect? There certainly had been other examples of Trump saying controversial things towards women that wound up on the editing room floor in my question. Um, you know, I didn't expect Trump to like that question, but we had a lot of tough questions for everybody there. I didn't really expect any of them to love what we were asking them. It's a presidential debate it's situation. Not beanbag, as they say. Um, I just didn't expect him to stay on it like a dog with a bone for so long and so energetically. She gets out and she starts asking me all sorts of ridiculous questions. And, you know, you could see there was blood coming out of her eyes. Uh, blood coming out of her, wherever. You hear that, Trump? <laughs> Trump definitely ENTJ. And it took me a long time to realize he did that because he liked the story. He was angry in the beginning, but in the end, I think in the way we've come to see Trump likes storylines. You know, he likes grilling Ted Cruz or going after Marco Rubio or whoever he thinks his opponent is. Ron DeSanctimonious. Don't worry about it, little Marco. Gentlemen. He enjoys Don't fanning those flames, and I was just a reporter on the receiving end for a long time. Anything that's not boring. Yeah. I mean, honestly, he basically admitted that to me when I saw him in private at Trump Tower to put an end to the whole thing. Uh, I think he he understood that this was a good storyline for him, and he actually thought for me, too. And I think he was a little sad to let it go. But when I asked him, please, let it go, he immediately said, oh, fine, OK, got it. How is it a good storyline for him when he's saying, You've called women fat pigs, dogs, slobs, disgusting animals. How is that a good storyline? He thought the, you know, poking me piece of it was good for him. And I can see why he thought that. You know, I mean, I, I understand how awful media can be, especially to Republicans and certainly to, to Donald Trump. So I, I get what he was <laughs> perceiving. Because I just didn't put myself in that category. The media. People hate the media. And he was showing the world that not only is he unafraid of the media, he's unafraid of Fox News and one of its primetime anchors, one of its debate moderators. He'll take on anybody. He doesn't care. And that's why his poll numbers went up after he did that. T. Not necessarily because uh -oh. his Republican voters hated me, but I do think a lot of them just like my question, uh, but because he was proving something about himself. There, there were no sacred cows, John McCain, the judge in his, you know, Trump University case, me, gold star families, didn't matter. You said you think he looked at you as someone who, in another world, would have gone to bed with him. Well, yeah. <laughs> I had a history with him that suggested, you know, at some point perhaps that that was somewhere out there, but uh, no. But you had a history that suggested that? Well, I've, I've known Trump for a long time. He's a very flirtatious guy with young women. Not that he ever did anything inappropriate with me, but I'm just saying, yeah, I fit the profile. You said DeSantis <laughs> can't win. 
the nomination if Trump runs again? Well, I just don't think anybody else could win if Trump runs. So, and I don't, I just, really? I so don't you, know. you think if they got on a stage, you, you don't think that DeSantis is, is crafty enough or the record no. stands enough to, really? No. Interesting. I don't even think that a little. And Trump Woo. just posted on. Uh, that's some S E N I there. This one's pragmatic. Truth Social. I agree. <laughs> and played a clip. You really think the hardcore MAGA is going to abandon Trump or DeSantis? They're not. Oh, did he? He did. Okay. You didn't know that. I knew he posted something. I didn't know so he did. So what do you think about that? Well, I guess I'm not surprised because it was analysis that happened to be good for Trump. Um, and it's what I happen to believe. I don't, I don't see how anyone can take Trump down and go on to win the nomination or certainly win the general. I, you can't okay. do it. The hardcore MAGA faithful will not abandon Trump for anyone. The only way they're going to get behind DeSantis is if Trump tells them it's okay. He doesn't want to run and he blesses it. But if it's a blood war between those two guys, they're not going to side with DeSantis over Trump. They're not going to do it. And if you they're think not they are, this, not you're not hardcore MAGA faithful. <laughs> Let's go back to personal stories. You're at Fox, your life very good. I couldn't believe you would voluntarily leave to go to NBC. Why? You wanted to see your kids. Yeah, that's it. That was just it? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a combination of things, but the number one reason was while my professional life was, you know, going like gangbusters, I was making money and I had, you know, what looked like success on paper. Success to I was not seeing them I... at all. I mean, they were... They had just gotten to the age, they were seven, five, and three, where the top two, the first two, I should say, were going off to school hours, where they would come home exactly when I would leave for work. So two out of the three, I didn't see at all Monday through Friday. And then the third was going to be on the same path. It wasn't good enough. That was same ridiculous. Path. Same that's path, not... that's future. Oh, I'm a working parent. We all make sacrifices. That's absenteeism. I felt like that's abandonment. And it just wasn't good enough for me. I was miserable. And then what was I doing for my job? Combat, yes. The Coliseum every night, okay. But toxic, toxic fuel, exhaust everywhere. Getting attacked all the time by stupid media writers I couldn't stand. By morons Oof. on cable news who would morons. say shit about me that wasn't true. Oof. I didn't want to be around these people anymore. You know, Oof. I just... My Fox friends I loved, but the industry was disgusting. I Ooh. didn't want to be with them. Ooh. And I thought if I go to NBC, I can get in, I can do this morning show, I'm out of there by 10, 15, I can raise my kids, I don't have to be around TV people, and I can do something less toxic than pos politics. I can do something more Oprah-esque, you know, something where we talk about our problems and getting better and, you know, being our best selves. And that's really a function of just where I was at that point in my life, which was unhappy. And yet what it all made clear is that the media is just as toxic and the viciousness and the bias, just the fact that you and I once worked at Fox is enough for people to just say we're evil. Yeah. It's just to hate. Yeah. Somebody once said to me at ABC, they stab you in the front at CBS. They stab you in the back. And at NBC, you have no idea they stabbed you at all. You just look down and you're dying. You're dead. <laughs> it's gone. Happened. Um, that sounds about right. Uh, yeah, and then any association with Fox News is going to be on you. You know, I remember a, an executive of a competing, competitive network trying to say, the, the thing you're going to have to decide if you want to leave Fox, and this guy was making me a big offer, is when, how soon do you need to leave? How long is too long to stay at Fox where you can't get the taint off of you? <laughs> you think, yeah, I'm okay with the Fox News taint. You know, I think I'm doing great journalism and I have a really big platform and I chose not to go to his network. The oh, time oh, at NBC oh, was, oh. I can't imagine how sneakily ugly they made it. It had been a solid year of attacks. I mean, vicious attacks like every other day, every other week. Let's not forget, before she was NBC News' Megyn Kelly, for over a decade, she was Fox News' Megyn Kelly. Basically a pretty race-baiting puppet who Roger Ailes kept trying to put his hand up. 
Everything I said was controversial and turned into some story about how terrible I was. You do get in trouble if you are a white person who puts on yes. black face yes. on Halloween or a black person who puts on white face yes. for Halloween. Like, I, that, okay, that, when I was a kid, that was okay as long as you were dressing up as like a character. And Jimmy Kimmel and Joy Behar had worn blackface. Yeah. Oh, man, and many stars on NBC, and NBC had been airing shows as recently as two or three years earlier with characters in blackface. But you're the racist. Yeah. It was about you. For saying, you know, when I was a kid, people used to wear this, and it wasn't really a thing. Um, so when did we get... I would have said that. When did we get to this point? That's what I was asking. About an NBC show that had just shown blackface. It was Bravo, which NBC owns. I was saying, why, why should she be canceled, this woman? You know, she clearly was trying to tribute, pay, pay tribute to Diana Ross. So how do we get to this point, right, where the rules used to be this way and now they're this way? And all hell broke loose. But what drove you right. to the point... Watching that apology now. You may have heard that yesterday we had a discussion here about political correctness and Halloween costumes. And that conversation turned to whether it is ever okay for a person of one race to dress up as another. A black person making their face lighter or a white person making theirs darker to make a costume complete. I defended the idea, saying as long as it, as it was respectful and part of a Halloween costume, it seemed okay. Well, I was wrong, and I am sorry. It's just not you. The apology, you have to understand the mindset I was in. And at that point, I just felt beaten down. I just felt so low. Mm -hmm. And I was being told by everyone that what I had said was terrible. And I'm guessing all of Megyn Kelly's friends are white. It's, it's not okay anymore to say I didn't know. You can't just say that anymore. It's 2018, and she didn't understand what blackface means. Right. It's not like now, where you have a constituency and the country kind of splits on these culture wars, and one side takes one position, and another side takes another. I had enough bad blood between, say, me and the Trump hardcore faithful that they didn't want to defend anything I said or did. A lot of Republicans were mad at me for going to NBC in the first place. They felt like that was a betrayal, even though my politics never changed, nor did my political coverage at all, if you go back and look at it. So they weren't too, you know, keen to jump in. Yeah, I always and the thought left of your me. politics is kind of lefty. No, I wouldn't say that. But I, for almost all of my Fox years, I had some issues on which I was more left-leaning and some on which I was more right-leaning. But in the way the country shifted now, I don't know what I'm lefty on. I feel like I'm much more on the right now because the country's changed. What does it mean to be more socially liberal now? Nothing I identify with, that's for sure. Um, but anyway, so yeah, the left loved me as long as, as they perceived me as, um, you know, the fox in the hen house while I was at Fox News. But as soon as they saw me, in their view, switch to their team, they were angry. I had made up with Trump. I had written a book that talked about my experience with Trump, and I had not published it before his election, as though my book could have stopped him. Uh, and, you know, I think they were just pissed off. Trump won. I was from Fox. Whatever. In, in many ways, the whole thing was a blessing. It got me out of there. It showed me the truth about these people. Oh, cool. And it began the next phase of my career, which has been the best yet. I want to be able to say, when Trump does something outrageous, that it was outrageous. And, and not get any blowback from my employer. Was there blowback from freedom. Fox? Yeah, definitely. Don't be so hard on him? Yeah. I'm disappointed. I thought they were grown-ups and they understood that was part of the... You gotta they understand. never said a peep to me. Of course, <laughs> I, wasn't, I was a small fry at that point. And, and I was in the crosshairs. You know, I mean, I, everything I said about him was generating headlines mm. after okay. that debate. And even for a while prior to. Um, his point was... He was scared. He was losing a, a portion of the Fox News base who felt Fox, not just me, but the Fox, wasn't being fair to Trump. And in a way, they had a point. All of our pundits back then were these, you know, we might, they might be derided as rhinos by today's, you know, Lex. All right, so we're done here. Um, Megyn Kelly is a ENTJ. Um, she is pragmatic. Um, pragmatic. And she's S-E and I. So with that being said, that kills that, and she is an ENTJ. So ENTJs are initiating, obviously, the abstract, the systematic, 
um, the direct, the pragmatic, the outcome, the SENI, and the TFI. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. This is Mongolian Mindset, and we're out.